This is the lecture for um, lesson number 21, covering John chapter 15, verse 26, all the way to the end of uh, John chapter 16. <clears throat> Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, um, you are uh, our Father of glory. You are our pure Father of light, and your splendor, because of our sin, is... Um, hidden somewhat from our earthly eyes. And yet, Lord, we ask now that you would um, open our spiritual eyes through your the gift of your Holy Spirit. Help us as we read this chapter, chapter 16. And uh, we ask, Lord, that you would bless the truths that we find here to our hearts and to our minds. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, some of you may be aware, um, but my hobby is um, fly fishing. You can see it back here on the sign. Maybe you've inferred it from seeing that, seeing that statue back there behind me. Um, but um, yeah, as much as I like to fly fish, uh, since I've become the teaching leader of this class some um, 17 years ago, I haven't got to fish nearly as often as I like to. Hopefully that'll change here in the spring here, come May when the class ends, I'll be able to go fishing. Um, my son Nick and I um, uh, often go in the spring on weekend trips to Northern California. In the past, we've been able to spend a week or two in Montana. And um, most of the streams we fish, whether it be in California or in the Rockies, um, are streams that um, we've become very familiar with. Uh, but I am always looking uh, forward to f exploring new rivers. Uh, this particular, this last weekend here, um, my son and I went to the fly fishing show at the Pleasanton Fairgrounds. And there, well, while we were there, we went uh, to a number of seminars, talked to a number of outfitters there, and uh, talked to folks that were experienced on some of the streams that we're interested in fishing. And whenever I fish unknown waters, I have found it best to hire a guide. A good guide will help you learn new waters quickly. Uh, a good guide will help you adapt to the different or the unique conditions that you find in an unknown place. A good guide will make all the difference in the world in terms of productivity. He can be the difference between a great day of fishing and a, even a frustrating day of fishing. That's what our lesson is about this week. Not fishing, but having a good guide. Jesus' disciples were heading into unknown waters. They were faced with life apart from Jesus. And Jesus was preparing them by promising them the Holy Spirit to send as a counselor, a guide, the best guide of all, the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would make all the difference in the world to their ministry, to the world. Without the Holy Spirit, uh, they would live frustrated, troubled lives. But with him, they would be productive witnesses. They would experience his peace and his joy. And so my goal for this lesson is to show you that the Holy Spirit is still active today, accomplishing God's purposes in the lives of his people. The promises that are pre presented here to the 11 disciples, they are the same promises we have today. And so we've got the outline um, is available to you. Three parts here for you. First of all, we see Jesus promises the Holy Spirit will convict the world. That's chapter 15, verse 26 to 16, 11. And what we'll learn here in this first division is that the Holy Spirit is with us when we witness to the world. And so this passage connects us directly to uh, the end of chapter 15 we studied last week. And then Jesus promises the Holy Spirit will guide believers. Verses 12 to 15. The Holy Spirit is with us when we study the Bible. He, he inspired the Bible. Therefore, he is the best guide for, uh, to, to interpret the Bible for us. And then Jesus teaches that sorrow will turn to joy in this new relationship with the Holy Spirit. And that's the balance of chapter 16. With the world, there will be trouble. 
we were, we've learned that we learned that last week. But with Jesus, there will be joy and peace. So, let's dig in here to this passage. Having learned about the world's hatred last week, the logical thing would be for us to keep a low profile. That is to send the disciples who ought to go out in the desert and establish a monastery. But that was the opposite of what the Lord wanted. And we, we pick it up in verse, chapter 15, verse 26, where Jesus said, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of Truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you must also you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. In the face of the world's opposition, Jesus promised divine help. The Holy Spirit would testify about him. Jesus would return to his Father's right hand, but his testimony would continue, and it would be due um, to the Holy Spirit. And that was not enough, though. God, in his mysterious ways, has chosen to use frail men to further the cause of Christ. Jesus commanded the 11 to testify to the facts as they knew them. And they had been with him for the very beginning of his, his public ministry. Now, why would Jesus tell his disciples about the world's hatred and persecution? Well, chapter 16, verse 1, he explained, expecting trouble would help his disciples to remain steadfast in serving God. In verse 4, he said, that he had not told them previously because he was with them. He'd been able to protect them. Knowing all of this ahead of time would strengthen the disciples for, uh, for when the persecution would come. The earliest Christians were Jews, and they continued to be engaged in Jewish society and worship. Eventually, the, the tensions increased to the point that they were expelled from the synagogues. The book of Acts records how this played itself out. In fact, it got so bad in, verse, in Acts chapter 7 that the Jews stoned Stephen. And later, King Herod got involved and had James executed. And he did this to please the Jews. Many people have been who have persecuted Christians have been active religious folks. They have knowledge of God, but it's not a saving knowledge. It's not a knowledge that leads them to repentance. They think that, that they are doing God a service by killing Christians. And we pick this up in, the, in chapter 16, verse 5, where Jesus says, But now I am going to him, that's God the Father, who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Jesus' departure had so depressed his disciples that they were, they were in shock. So obsessed by their imminent loss, they couldn't even question him about it. They were grieving. But, but had they known what Jesus knew, they would have been glad because the disaster that they faced, that they had faced, uh, that faced them ahead would, would result in great gain for them. So why was it necessary for Jesus to, to, to go? It, it was going, it was going to be painful for him. In verse, in verse 7, Jesus said, it is good that I'm going away. It, it was in their best interest that he leave. The Greek word, there is sifari. It's translated as good in the NIV. It means profitable. It means beneficial. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth. What the 11 needed to hold on to was that his departure was in their best interest. Unless Jesus departed and returned to his father, the council would not come to them. Now, I don't think that, that, that there is some metaphysical reason why Jesus and the Holy Spirit uh, could not dwell simultaneously with believers. Um, what Donald Carson says is he, he thinks the reason was an eschatological one. 
all of the Old Testament prophecies concerning the promise of the Holy Spirit seem to apply to the church age. But the church age could not begin until Jesus had died and risen from the dead and then been exalted to his Father's right hand. He needed to return to the glory that he had enjoyed before the world began. He, we, we had that great question regarding our choice of having the physical Jesus as the, as the disciples did or having him in the form of the Holy Spirit as we do today. Well, Jesus himself gives us the correct answer. It's for our own good. Being in his physical presence on earth would only satisfy our curiosity about him. During his incarnation, Jesus was limited by the, his physical body. He could reach only so many people. But today, the Holy Spirit indwells millions of believers continually, simultaneously. And think of how spiritually dull that the disciples were in the Gospels. They, they were intelligent men, but their inability to comprehend spiritual truths had nothing to do with their intellect. They didn't have the Holy Spirit as their counselor. We do today. And Jesus' death was necessary to atone for our sins. His sacrifice was what prepared us to be worthy vessels in which the Holy Spirit could dwell. Unless Jesus returned to glory, he would not be able to send the counselor. The word translated as counselor, again, we talked about this last week, is paraclete. Paraclete describes a legal assistant, one who pleads in our defense. And that's what he does for, for us as believers. However, in verse 8, we see that he has another legal role, and that is of, as a prosecuting attorney. He will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Convict seems like an awfully strong word, but the Greek word there, Alencho, translated as convicts, means to expose, to put to shame, to accuse. The idea is that the Holy Spirit causes unbelievers to acknowledge uh, their guilt. And the world is guilty in three areas. According to Jesus, the Holy Spirit convicts the world in regards to sin. As the prosecutor, the Holy Spirit presents the facts to an unbelieving world such that they know they know God's truth. The, the sin that they are convicted of is not necessarily the specific sins that we are all guilty of, murder, slander, coveting. It is the sin of unbelief. Not believing in Jesus is the ultimate sin. And yet his convicting work is done in a gracious way. It, it is for the purpose of causing us to recognize our need and repent. But not all repent and believe. And so conviction doesn't necessarily translate into conversion. The Holy Spirit always convicts the guilty heart. Unbelievers may not admit it. They may not respond positively, but they do know. And I think back on my own conversion. Even as I responded positively to the gospel, I wanted no part of it. I was amazed to hear my positive words coming out of my mouth. It's what I think theologians call irresistible grace. But not everyone responds to the truth appropriately. Human pride often prevents our proper response. Even in the light of the full knowledge of our sin, only those chosen by the Father respond appropriately. And then Jesus says that the Holy Spirit convicts the world in regards to righteousness. Verse 10, he said this is because he was going to the Father where men could not see him any longer. When the Jews crucified Jesus, they thought that they had killed an unrighteous man. They called him demon-possessed. They accused him of blasphemy. But God the Father vindicated Jesus through his resurrection and ascension. That is why the, the resurrection is essential to our faith. It is the proof that Jesus is who he says he is. He is righteous. The world thinks that they are righteous on their own. The Holy Spirit exposes our so-called righteousness for what it is. 
It's riddled with sin. Isaiah 64, 6, the prophet there says, confessed, he confessed that all our righteous acts are like filthy rags before God. And it's true. God looks on our hearts. He sees more corruption in our acts of service than we see in our outright rebellion. And then Jesus says the Holy Spirit convicts the world in regards to judgment. That's verse 11. This conviction is true because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Satan holds power over men through sin and death. But Jesus' sinless life and victory over death have broken its hold over us. Jesus' death and resurrection condemn Satan. Therefore, unbelievers need to take note and fear the Lord. Jesus holds the power of judgment. While Satan is defeated and judged, we know that he's still active in this world. I like what uh, James Boyce says. He, he likens Satan's work today to, to Hitler during the last years of, the, of World War II. When the Allies landed on Normandy and they established that strong foothold on the European continent, most people knew that it was just a matter of time before Germany would fall. But the German leadership led a desperate fight all the way to the very end. Hitler took as many lives with him as he could. And that's what I think Satan is doing today. His defeat is certain, but he is ferociously working to take as many souls with him as he can. Let me give you the first principle then. That is that having God's spirit gives us access to God's power. No one comes to Christ without being convicted of their sins. The Holy Spirit does the convicting, but he does it in conjunction with the word of God and the witness of the child of God. This is the amazing privilege and responsibility for us. As such, it is essential that we understand our roles in this process. We witness and the Holy Spirit does the persuading. No one has ever received Christ apart from the Holy Spirit. So I ask you, how does the Holy Spirit's role as a prosecutor encourage your witness? You see, when we faithfully share the gospel with unbelievers, it is the Holy Spirit who is convicting them with regard to sin, righteousness, and judgment. They may not admit it, and they may not repent, but they do know. They know their guilt. And so, we have nothing to fear from this world. It is a judged place. And we have nothing to fear because we have God's Spirit with us, guiding us. Now, the 11 were unable to receive any more spiritual truth at this time. And I'm sure there was a number of reasons for this. So the Holy Spirit would come to them later at a more opportune time. And we read about this beginning in verse 13. Jesus said, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All of that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Jesus repeated a previous teaching here regarding the Spirit's role, and that is that he will guide believers into all truth. At the right time, the Holy Spirit would cause the disciples to recall Jesus' words. He would cause them to understand his words in light of the cross, and he would inspire the apostles to record the truth, this truth, for future generations. And he continues to guide each of us today. As you and I study the Bible, we, as we rely on the Holy Spirit, he reveals these truths to us. And then he, the Holy Spirit will not speak on his own. He will, he will speak only what he hears. 
The Holy Spirit does not work by his own initiative. That, that he, he does not speak apart from God the Father and God the Son. Just as Jesus was completely dependent on his Father, so too is the Holy Spirit. The, the, this inner dependency of the three persons of the Trinity assures us that they are in com complete, complete har harmony. If, if someone says that they have received a message from the Holy Spirit that contradicts the rest of the scriptures, well, that's a sign that it's not from him. The Bible is the knowledge and wisdom of God. All the Father possesses are the sons, and the Spirit of truth speaks only what he hears from the Son. He has made it known to the disciples who, like the prophets before them, recorded the message. It is this divine chain of custody that makes the Bible completely trustworthy. It is the testimony of the Bible that all the scriptures are God-breathed. Peter said, For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the one who inspired all the Old Testament and New Testament writings takes his direction from the Father. Sixty-six books and letters make up the Bible, but there's only one author, and so this book is one harmonious message. And then we see from Jesus that the Holy Spirit will tell us what is yet to come. This statement helps us to understand what Jesus said previously concerning guiding us into all truth. The Holy Spirit would help the disciples understand God's plan. He would help them interpret events as they occurred and then see how they all fit together. And he would also give them insight into future events. In fact, John's writings of Revelation will be an example of that when we study this next year. And then the Holy Spirit will bring glory to Jesus. The Holy Spirit is the least understood person of the Godhead. He never points to himself. His assignment is to point people to Jesus Christ for his glory. Only to the extent that he teaches concerning his role in the Godhead and with respect uh, to us, does the Holy Spirit reveal himself. This passage is a perfect example. The Holy Spirit glorified Christ as he revealed the things of Christ to the apostles. And as he caused them to better understand the person of Christ and his redemptive work, he glorified him. That's what it means to glorify God, to make known his divine character and purposes. And the Holy Spirit continues to glorify Christ today as he teaches us the things of Jesus. And so this second principle this, this week is having God's Spirit gives us access to God's mind. I don't know what your reasons are for being here in this class, but the best reason is to know Jesus Christ better. It is through an intimate knowledge of him that we come to love him and obey him. And it's through our relationship with him that we are then reconciled to the Father. There are people who have studied the Bible all their lives and do not know Jesus personally. They don't know the one for whom this book is all about. And that's a great tragedy. The Holy Spirit inspired the writing of the Bible. So it is appropriate that he be the one who interprets it for us. In school, students who struggle often have to make use of tutors to understand. And you and I should never struggle with the Bible because we are children of God. We have the best tutor of all. So I ask you, what new truths about Christ have you learned this year? Any insights that we gain about Jesus are not due to our intelligence. They are due to the Spirit's revelation. And when he dwells within us, we have access to know something of God's mind. <clears throat> now, having covered the role of the Holy Spirit, Jesus then addressed the disciples' immediate future. He said, in a little while you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. 
if the disciples were confused before, it appears now they're really messed up. And this led to quite a discussion between them. What did Jesus mean in a little while? And what did he mean by, you will see me no more, and then you will see me? Well, there are a number of ways to look at this. In a little while, you would see me no more. Well, certainly in a matter of hours, Jesus would be arrested and taken for trial. In a little while, he'd be flogged and crucified and buried in a tomb, and they would see him no more. But in verse 20, Jesus said that this would be a time when they would weep and mourn while the world rejoiced. And certainly that was true. The Jews surely did rejoice. They had rid themselves of Jesus and his perceived threat to their way of life. And the prince of this world certainly rejoiced because he thought he had defeated God's son. But then, after a little while, they did see him again. That Sunday morning, the women came to John and to Peter with news of the empty tomb. And later he appeared to the disciples and they touched him and he ate with them. And their grief turned to joy. So it would seem that Jesus' words fit his death and post-resurrection appearances. But then, in a little while, Jesus would leave them again and ascend to heaven. At his departure, they would see him no more. And again, they must have felt some sorrow. After a little while, they did see him again. On Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they saw Jesus in a completely different way. They experienced him through the Spirit, an intimacy that they had never had before. And again, their sorrow was replaced by joy. But there's the third way in which we can view Jesus' statement. And that concerns us today. Even though we have the Holy Spirit, Paul said, now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. After a little while, we will see him. That is when Jesus Christ returns again. It is then that we will see him as he truly is in all his glory. And at that time, our light and momentary troubles, our grieving will have been worth it. And that, that's the point of Jesus' illustration. A woman in childbirth is in tremendous pain. For her, the hours of labor seem like an eternity. But when her child arrives, all that's forgotten. The, the very inf, uh, infant that created the suffering becomes the object of, her, of the mother's joy. And that was how it was for the disciples. Their sorrow was over Jesus' death. But later his death would be their joy. They would understand their need for a Savior. His death ultimately became the focus of their message. In verses 23 and 24, Jesus said that the disciples will no longer ask him anything. And that's because he would be with his father. Their new relationship with the Holy Spirit would help them. And previously, the, the, the disciples had not prayed in Jesus' name. But, but that would change after he departed. In verse 26, the, the phrase, in that day, probably refers to the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. To pray in Jesus' name is not some cosmic formula. When we pray in Christ's name, our request should be aligned with his will. To call on Jesus' name is to agree with him in totality. With that, when that is so, we can be confident that the Father will answer our prayers. Repeatedly, Jesus made these promises. God would answer believers' prayers. This new relationship that we have with the Holy Spirit is to be characterized by prayer. To not pray is to miss out on much of what God has for us. This new relationship with the Holy Spirit would also lead to intimacy with the Father and a clear spiritual understanding. Christ's death on the cross has reconciled believers to the Father. So, in verse 26, Jesus said he no, he no longer needed to pray for them because 
they now had direct access to God the Father. This does not negate his intercessory revolt role on our behalf. I believe that what he's saying is he, he was teaching us that we are so loved by God, we can now go directly to him in prayer. In verse 28, Jesus summarized his mission. He said, I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. It covers his incarnation and his humiliation, his death, resurrection, and finally his ascension. This would be what the 11 would teach, and it's what we believe today. Surprisingly, the disciples responded in confidence. Finally, they claimed to understand and believe. They confessed Jesus' omniscience. And, he, he, and I think he demonstrated that knowledge by his skeptical response to them. Despite their claim, he knew just how weak they were because within a few hours, they would desert him and scatter for their lives. Jesus' prediction that they would scatter was actually from Zechariah 13, where Zechariah wrote that the shepherd will be struck and the sheep will be scattered. Human loyalty and love only go so far. The, the, the disciples would fail Jesus miserably. On the other hand, divine love and loyalty never fails us. And so Jesus ended his upper room discourse in verse 33. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. These instructions that we've studied here for the last four weeks were intended to sustain the disciples in this world. Each person who is in Christ maintains a dual existence. We are in Christ, and yet we're still in the world. And because we are in Christ, the world is going to be hostile towards us. As they treated the prophets in Christ, they are going to treat us. And it, it, it is the way that the darkness always treats the light. But, but in the face of that hostility, Jesus gives us his peace and the reminder that he has already gained victory. And so my final principle is that joy and peace are found only in Jesus. Notice the contrast. The world offers sorrow and trouble. Jesus offers joy and peace. And his joy and peace are permanent. That's because they are independent of circumstances. And that's because they are based on what God has accomplished for us. Jesus said, take heart. And he means, take courage, cheer up. I'm one who can easily get discouraged. Whether it's watching the evening news or some family issue, I find myself sometimes in a state of depression. I used to work with a man who would give me a bad time about my attitude. He'd see me down in the mouth and he'd yell, get your head up. That's what Jesus is saying, get your head up. When I get discouraged, it's because I'm focused on the wrong place. I suspect that's true for many people. We should be looking to Jesus because he is the source of our joy and peace. So I ask you, where are you looking these days? The world is a defeated place, and we ought not to let it get us down. Look to Jesus, because he has overcome the world. Will you join me in prayer? Father in heaven, as we um, take leave of this place here, we pray that, uh, that we will always rely on your Holy Spirit uh, to keep us close to you. He is the best guide of all. And we pray, Lord, that, um, that he will reveal your mind and your heart to us, that we may grow in our love and our reliance on you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.